were looking for the exits, and he was very, very unsettling. Well, thank you very much, <laughs> No, please, don't do no. Oh, blimey! <laughs> oh, God! Oh, good Lord, let's be back, God. Oh. Well, taking my life in my hands, because I admired Norman so much, I asked if he'd take part in an hour special, which he did, and he was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Interviewing Norman was hell. I mean, he was... Uh, a brilliant raconteur, and uh, he knew exactly how he was going to time every gag, and that was the way. And you couldn't just ask him a question because he was going to tell you his way. Norma, still uh, <laughs> kissing the girls at 82, still working at 82, no, still well, making people laugh at 82. I'm more than 82, girls. <laughs> <laughs> I was speaking of your years. It's oh. impossible to think oh, of you. My, ear. my ears are all right. But... <laughs> It was extremely funny, and of course the audience enjoyed the fact that he ran rings round me, he popped up all over the place, he was totally dangerous, unpredictable, and always very funny. As the cameras stopped rolling on the Esther show, Norman's antics continued. And the audience uh, clapped, and the, as the applause died, Norman leant forward, looked me straight in the eyes, and licked the end of my nose. A sensation I will never forget. Hasn't happened much since. Norman would often push the boundaries of protocol. Throughout his career, he was a firm favorite of the royal family, appearing at nine command performances and coming face to face with royalty on many memorable occasions. I had him working at St. James's Palace once, but I had to lead the line up along uh, to, for all the artists to meet the Duchess of Kent. Vera Lynn was on the show as well. And I said to Norman, if you stand next to Vera, he said, no, 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 I'm doing that. So he hid behind a big pillar until I'd introduced the Duchess of Kent to all the artists. And then he jumped out on her and went, Ugh! <laughs> And I thought, you can't do that to royalty, but that's the way he is. He forgets that they are royalty and just they're friends to him, so he just joins in the fun. He had me chasing around St James's Palace on one occasion. We were there at a, a, a tea party for the Queen Mother. She she used to run these tea parties for ex-servicemen, and 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 uh, he uh, was there on one occasion. And of course, he was always pl playing the fool, and and he was chasing me. <laughs> I'm trying to twix my nose. But uh, that was him, you know, he, he couldn't help but uh, play the fool. When he went to get his honour, Prince Philip met him, and everyone's waiting in this big room, you see, waiting for the Queen to appear, and uh, Prince Philip came over to him and said, hello, Norman, how are you doing? And he said, oh, thank you, sir, fine, and one thing, another. Then all of a sudden, there was there, you know, the, the trumpet going up. And uh, Norman said, what's that? And, and, and Prince Philip said, oh, that'll be the Queen. And Norman said, bloody hell, she can't half play that trumpet, can she? <laughs> For the first time in a quarter of a century, the Queen has been visiting the Isle of Man. Waiting to meet her was the island's allegedly most famous resident and royal favourite, Sir Norman Wisdom. Jenny Bond reports on today's gripping encounter. This was the Queen's first visit to the Isle of Man for 25 years, and she took the precaution of wearing a sprig of its national herb, mugwort, on her lapel. It's supposed to ward off evil spirits. It did not, however, ward off the rather persistent attentions of Sir Norman Wisdom. Now 88 is an old favourite among the royals who's performed for them at Windsor Castle. Taking the Queen firmly by the hand as she arrived at a cheese stall, he invited her to pose with him for the photographers. Next, he suggested she should try some of the cheese. No, not now. Not now, said the Queen, showing him instead that she was being given some to take away. But Sir Norman wanted a longer chat. Ignoring royal protocol, he crept up and touched her on the arm, then took her hand and hung on and on. I don't think the Queen will forget him. <laughs> it was quite a surprise to me when I heard, uh, you know, he's given her a piece of cheese to eat. Terrible, really. I mean, who else would do that but Norman Wisdom? And who else but Norman Wisdom could achieve the status of a country's hero? His visual comedy has always appealed to audiences in Eastern Europe, nowhere more so than in Albania. 
a lot of the uh, dictatorship over there, especially in Albania, thought that Norman represented the downtrodden communist uh, by the capitalist, which is untrue completely. The people were, were kind of subjected to a pretty awful regime and the only joy of which came when they saw, on maybe on Sunday night, the Norman Wisdom film. They were shown every week and it's kept going, you know, for 30, 40, 50 years they've just had Norman Wisdom and, and so he's so in their hearts, it's extraordinary. And in 2002, Tony Hawk saw a chance to win a bizarre challenge. Well, I took on a wacky bet that I had to have a hit record somewhere in the world within two years, because I'd had a hit record in 1988, a song called Stutter Rap by Morris Minor and the Majors, and somebody called me a one-hit wonder, and I said, well, I haven't finished living my life yet. I'll probably have another hit. So I set off going all around the world trying to have this hit and failed until I struck upon this idea of pure genius, which was to involve myself with Norman Wisdom in Albania. Remarkably, Tony persuaded Oscar-winning lyricist Sir Tim Rice to write the song. So Sir Tim phoned Sir Norman. I was excluded from that conversation. I rang him up and put forward this strange proposition that he should record a song for us, which would be a top 20 hit in Albania. And uh, Norman agreed, you know, oh, I'll do it if you say, oh, yeah, we're Albania, oh, yeah, they like me there, yeah, I'll do it. We therefore wrote a song, Tony and I, called Big in Albania. And Norman went along with this. He loved the idea, and he came down to London and he recorded it. The next plan was Operation Tour Albania. The morning we left at Heathrow Airport, uh, Norman began the journey by running up the down escalator at 87 years old and going straight through the uh, security cordon without going through the bit in the middle. He walked up the side of it. And this was only, uh, you know, six months after September the 11th and security was very high and Norman walked straight through it and into Sock Shop, the other side. He was always doing his act, but in a way it wasn't his act. It was Norman being Norman. He just had this desire, this necessity to entertain. I'm amazed that in some places we went to, he wasn't shot. <laughs> Tari to Karitsa, from Giacastra to Barat, from Bologna to Tirana, I'm really where is that? In Albania, everybody loves Norman. It was like a scene for Take That, but with an 87 year old man. It was extraordinary. He got lost on at least two occasions, but always turned out we just looked for a big crowd, and there he was. <laughs> and the little shepherds and all these fellas with donkeys up the hill would say, ah, Pitkini, Pitkini, ah, we love you, we love you. And he was getting kissed by men, kids, boys, girls, all sorts of people. They just loved him out there. I made my name in many places, a thousand falls, a thousand paces, but nowhere's more devoted than Albania. Miming superbly with Tim's daughter on backing vocals, his son on trumpet, Sir Tim was happy to perform on a plastic toy saxophone. We were all thrilled to be in the presence of somebody that my kids thought was as funny as I did. As I wandered down his fine Albanian street. Well, I had this dream that if we were going to be a supergroup, which Norman Wisdom and the Pitkins clearly were, uh, that we had to perform a stadium gig. So I arranged for us to perform at half-time at the National Football Stadium in Tirana. Norman Wisdom and the Pickens did not disappoint their fans. Well, the outcome of the bet was rather a happy conclusion in that the Albanian people in their 20s and 30s voted for us and we reached the dizzy heights of number 18 in the Albanian chart. So we all celebrated on the way back. And Norman, of course, had had his first hit in Albania. And surely that's everyone's ambition, isn't it? For the last 30 years of Norman's life, he lived on the Isle of Man. It was a place close to his heart. He lived in Alaman in a beautiful house. He designed it himself. He had these fabulous cars which he used to try and design. He had a huge 